It's stolen away with five seconds, four seconds, three, two. Jordan, let's fly. It is over. The Destiny Darlings have done it. The Duke Blue Devils have won their first ever national basketball championship. 72 to 65 over the Kansas Jayhawks. The 91 national championship made all the final fours before that better. It, it gave Duke its rightful place in the history of our great sport. Because uh, truly, Duke is one of the, the great programs in the history of college basketball. It wasn't like Mike Krzyzewski. He had just built this program. I mean, Duke basketball had a, a very rich tradition before, before I ever got here. By that team doing it once and then doing it back to back, I think they lended credibility to all of our efforts. Uh, tremendous credibility. I think any player who played at Duke and who had moved on to a Final Four or didn't uh, had to take a great deal of pride because we all have a feeling for the program and these kind of guys kind of put the icing on the cake. You know, I'll always feel that every time they go to the NCAA Final Four, every time they've won one, that I've won. That's how I look at it. Because I was here as one of the players that was here that, that helped turn the program around. You know, I like to think that the guys that are playing ball at this program understand and realize that, you know, we built this house at their end. They may have put the roof on it, but we built it. As the sweet taste of consecutive national championships lingers on the Duke University campus, it's hard to imagine a time when Duke basketball did not exist. But that was the case almost a century ago, when the physical education director at what was then Trinity College, a man named Cap Card, nailed the first two peach baskets inside the walls of the Ark, or what was then Duke Gymnasium. Card rounded up as many curious athletes as he could find, introduced them to America's newest sport, and eventually, in 1906, assembled the school's first basketball team. Unfortunately, none of today's technology was around to record Trinity's first game, a 24-10 defeat at the hands of nearby Wake Forest College. We can only imagine what it must have been like to play basketball on this tiny 32 by 50 foot court, so small that oftentimes the players would shoot the ball the entire length of the floor into a peach basket that still had its bottom in it. The low point total indicated that the players still had a lot to learn, but they weren't the only ones. The game was stopped with regularity so that the opposing team's coach, who happened to be the referee, could consult the rule book. You could see that happening today. Cap Card posted an impressive 30 and 17 record in seven seasons at Trinity. But 10 coaches followed in the next 15 years as Trinity College became Duke University and the basketball program continued to search for identity and stability. In 1923, the team moved out of the arc and across campus to Memorial Gym, built as a memorial to the veterans of the World War, or what we now know as World War I. By the end of the Roaring Twenties, the team moved again to the appropriately named Card Gymnasium on Duke's West Campus. But a more important change occurred in 1929, when assistant football coach Eddie Cameron took over the hoops program, and Duke basketball began receiving national attention for the first time. Cameron made an immediate impact as his second team in 1930 won 18 of 20 games, including an upset of Loyola, the nation's best team. One of Cameron's players that year was Duke's first All-American, Bill Werber. Another was Bo Lee Farley. Eddie Cameron was uh, uh, quite an innovator, I thought, in basketball. Back in those days, things were a whole lot different. You can imagine that far away we how many changes have been made in basketball but eddie did a good job of coaching we do a, did a lot of things then and we're doing now for defenses and all but uh, he did a good job cameron continued an outstanding 14-year career including southern conference titles in 1938 41 and 42. the 1942 team cameron's last went 22 and 2 which 50 years later stands as the Blue Devils' third best record in history. Eddie Cameron is remembered as a great basketball coach, having won nearly 70% of his games. He's remembered as a great innovator, having been a founder of the ACC basketball tournament. But perhaps his greatest achievement at Duke was in creating this arena, which today stands as one of the most famous and feared in the nation. 
Legend has it that Cameron sketched out the original design for a new arena on the back of a matchbook cover. Those plans only called for 5,000 seats, but by the time the new building opened in 1940, more than 8,000 fans jammed into what the university then called its indoor stadium to see the first game, a 36-27 win over Princeton. That sellout crowd was the largest in the history of Southern basketball and started a great tradition in an arena that was then one of the largest in America. Today, more than 50 years later, Cameron's capacity is up only slightly to 9,314. As is often the case, numbers don't even begin to tell the story. Blue Devil players and coaches from the last five decades will tell you themselves, while other arenas may surpass it in size, no place can ever match the energy and excitement of a Duke basketball game in Cameron. The one thing that I think all Duke teams have going for them and to this day is Cameron Indoor Stadium. You can have a bad day in the classroom, you can not be feeling well, but when you approach that gym and you got 5,000 of your fellow students waiting in line to see you play, uh, that'll get your attention very quickly. Cameron's really a special place and the students, the Duke students are special and the, the, you know, probably the most creative in college basketball, we're basketball. And, uh, you know, it, it, you'd really, we'd be playing a game and one of my assistants would tap and my uh, arm and say, look at that sign. It's almost as if they're on a team. I mean, they're willing to do anything it takes for you to beat that team out there. Uh, I'll take it one step further. If you hadn't played in Cameron, I don't know if you've played college basketball. After leaving behind a world-class arena, Eddie Cameron's first act as Duke Athletic Director was to hire former assistant Jerry Girard. Girard won 131 games in eight seasons, while leading Duke to Southern Conference titles in 1944 and 46. Two of the best performers of the Girard era typified the style of play in college basketball in the 1940s. Ed Koffenberger, a left-handed hookshot artist, became Duke's first two-time All-America in 46 and 47, and was considered a big man at just six foot two. Corin Yeomans, who earned all Southern Conference honors in 1948, 49, and 50, led the Blue Devils in scoring for two straight seasons despite averaging just 11 points a game. When Girard's career at Duke ended suddenly in 1950 due to illness, he left his successor with a solid program. He also left behind a two-sport superstar named Dick Grote, who would go on to become one of the greatest players in the history of Duke basketball. Hal Bradley started his coaching career at Duke under less than ideal circumstances. Due to the uncertainty surrounding Girard's illness, he arrived in Durham just one month before the start of the 1950-51 season. To make matters worse, he was unsure about the status of Grote, the team's best player who had received an offer to play professional baseball during the offseason. Of course, Grote returned to Duke for two more award-winning seasons and left with a national scoring record in his two-and-a-half-year college career. An All-American in both baseball and basketball as a junior and senior, Duke's number 10 also became the first of five Blue Devils to receive National Player of the Year honors, and the first of six to have his number retired. Grote led Duke to a 24-6 record in 1952, averaging a startling 26 points a game before the growing crowds at the indoor stadium, and who knows how many points a game when nobody was around to watch. I had a deal with a maintenance man who, who would clean up, and when practice was over, I had exactly 50 minutes to one hour to shoot all by myself and then I would go in and shower when he told me he had 10 minutes left shower leave the window open in the dressing room I knew how to turn the lights on because he had explained that to me and I could break in the Cameron Indoor Stadium sneak up drop down on the floor and we had some great day games at Cameron at 12 1 o'clock in the morning and ironically uh, the campus police never once bothered us, and yet the, you could see the lights at the top in the middle of the night. We played an awful lot of games, uh, probably more there at night than I did during my career as a regular Duke player. After Grote left Duke in 1952 for a 14-year baseball career that included two world championships and National League MVP honors, Bradley seemed to have his work cut out for him. But the man who had impressed Eddie Cameron with his success at Hartwick College in New York never wavered leading Duke into the highly competitive Atlantic Coast Conference with one of the nation's most exciting and highest scoring teams. There against coaching giants like State's Everett Case and North Carolina's Frank McGuire, Bradley had two first place finishes in the ACC and never finished with a losing record. 
Bradley's 54 team was 9-1 in the ACC's inaugural season, 22-6 overall, and ranked as high as 8th nationally before finishing 15th. At only 6'3", team MVP Bernie Janicki dominated the boards and closed his career as the Blue Devils' all-time leading rebounder. Another interesting footnote to that memorable 54 season was that a left-handed Blue Devil reserve named Charles Drizel added his three points a game to the cause. Years later, Lefty returned as an opposing coach and became a favorite target of the Duke fans, who mocked Drizel by wearing skull caps in jest of his receding hairline. An upset win at home over Adolph Rupp's Kentucky team in 1957 laid the groundwork for Duke's 1958 team, the school's first to finish in the nation's top 10. After a 5-5 five five start, Bradley switched to his high-speed, flaming five lineup. Duke went on to an 18-7 overall record and an 11-3 conference mark, good enough for another first-place finish in the ACC. After earning ACC Coach of the Year honors in 59, Bradley resigned from Duke to take over the basketball program at Texas. What came next was the first golden age of Duke basketball, orchestrated in the 1960s by Vic Bubas. Athletic director Eddie Cameron pushed aside the 135 resumes on his desk and hired Bubas, despite the fact that he never applied. After four years as a player and eight more as an assistant for Everett Case at NC State, Bubas never hesitated when given the opportunity to take over the program of a highly regarded neighborhood rival. There's something about playing at an institution, then remaining there as an assistant coach, and then taking the head job that they always remember you as, quote, a, a little boy, unquote, that came to state. And I didn't want that. I wanted to go somewhere to have my own uh, identity. The results were nothing short of amazing. Ten consecutive winning seasons, six straight top ten finishes, five All-Americans, four ACC Tournament Championships, three ACC Coach of the Year awards. How did he do it? For starters, he got quality players with the help of a star-studded cast of assistants. From his first day on the job, Bubis had the likes of Fred Schabel, Bucky Waters, Tom Carmody, and future NBA greats Chuck Daly and Hubie Brown canvassing the nation in search of top talent. Indeed, Bubis's list of recruits reads like a geography test. Art Heyman from New York, Jeff Mullins from Lexington, Kentucky, Jack Marin from Farrell, Pennsylvania, Steve Vicendak from Scranton, Pennsylvania, Bob Verga from Seagirt, New Jersey. Mike Lewis from Missoula, Montana. Missoula, Montana? Now that's a story. Back then, the only way you get, could get to Montana was on Northwest Airlines, and I think the only way, I think the plane stopped somewhere between 12 times and 15 times between Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Missoula, Montana. And Coach Waters was coming out to visit one time, and my folks and I went out to pick him up at the airport. And when he got off the plane, he was as close to the color of a putting green as anyone I've ever seen. And he took me aside by the plane and he said, kid, I hope to God you can play. By any measure, Bubis turned recruiting into an art form. In retrospect, many say it was Bubis's persistence, innovation, and style that changed college coaching forever. I got credit for being a great recruiter, but it was out of necessity. Uh, now, if we did some good things during the recruiting process, that's good too. But getting started early and covering the country as, as we did was more a product of the academics at Duke, in my mind, than it was some master recruiting plan that I had in mind when I went there. Nonetheless, Bubis's recruiting methods produced immediate results. Within weeks of accepting the Duke job, Bubis persuaded Heyman, who had already verbally agreed to attend North Carolina, to enroll at Duke. It was that quickly that Bubis corralled a primetime player who was the foundation of Duke's first basketball dynasty. I think our appeal to him was to kind of be a pioneer and get a new program off his feet. As you know, he was the cornerstone around which our program was built. At 6'5", 205 pounds, Art Heyman proved to be a worthy cornerstone. He was known for his powerful moves to the basket, showing no fear as he drove to the hoop. And he truly hated to lose. He's probably the most focused player I've ever played with from, from the standpoint of getting prepared to play a college game. Uh, every game was like going to war for him. Um, he uh, very, very seldom, in fact, I can't remember a game where he wasn't sick to his stomach before the game. He was such a, uh, so fired up to play. And he's very, very strong. 
unbelievable strength. One time he, you know how people put their hands like this in the huddle and, and so on. One time he bent my thumb back. I couldn't use it for a month. Uh, just the adrenaline flow, he just snapped his thumb. And, uh, and so, you know, whenever there was a timeout or a team, you'd see guys get up off the bench because he would literally run to the bench so hard that he would knock guys out of the way to get his seat. Indeed, Bubis knew from day one that his number 25 was a unique athlete and player and coach quickly developed a special bond that seemed to bring out the best in both of them. One story is that I had a car, a new car, my, excuse me, a new car my senior year, and he heard I was running around a little too much, and the first game we played Davidson, I scored 36 points. He says, you didn't look too good. I says, I want you to sell your car. I says, no, no, I'm not gonna sell my car. He says, well, you're not gonna play. So it was two days before, before the South Carolina game. I'll never forget that. Then he called me in about five hours before the game. He said, did you sell your car? He says, no. He says, well, you're not going to play. I says, what? He says, you're not going to play. Boy, I went downtown and I sold that car. He says, here it is, baby, because I was afraid of this man. Sometime I'd get mad at him and, 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 and his answer would be, you may be right about that. He said, but answer one thing for me. And I said, what's that? He says, have I ever not been ready to play? And I said, no you've always been ready to play and he was right in 1961 Heyman led the Blue Devils to a 22 and 6 finish in a number 10 national ranking in addition his selection to several All-America squads served as a building block for the Bubis reign in Durham Heyman's talent and flair put Duke basketball in the national headlines more than ever before and more and more high school basketball stars like Jeff Mullins of Lexington Kentucky started to take notice one of the uh, selling points that other coaches use was you don't want to go there you'll have to play with Art Heyman and the irony of that is that we became very very close friends and uh, and uh, and I enjoyed every minute of playing with Art uh, uh, Vic Bubis explained it this way he said you're gonna play with a young man that is, is a great player and uh, nobody wants to win more than Art Heyman and if you come uh, we're gonna win a lot of basketball games and and he was right a lot of high school players would say well if I go there you know, I'm going to have to deal with, uh, with an Art Heyman uh, uh, star situation, and maybe I'll just go somewhere else and be my own star. And that, that said a lot about Jeff Mullins, because he was a star in his own right, and the two of them together uh, were terrific. In 1963, with Heyman a hard-working senior and Mullins a sharpshooting junior, Duke's dynamic duo led Blue Devil basketball to unprecedented success. Duke went 27-3 overall and 14-0 in the conference, only the second team ever to go through an undefeated ACC season. It was the first of four straight first place finishes for Bubis's Devils, and they did it in style, pounding ACC opponents by an average of 18 points a game while becoming the first league team to shoot better than 50% from the floor. With a lineup of Heyman and Mullins at forward, Jay Buckley at center, and Fred Schmidt and Buzzy Harrison at guard, the Blue Devils rode a 15-game winning streak into the 63 ACC tournament. With only the tournament winner able to advance to NCAA play, the Blue Devils faced the pressure of knowing that one slip would end their season. It's a pressure. It's not like now you lose a game. It's really not that madness because you know you're going to go to AC, the NCAA, how many teams, 60-something teams. But here, if you lose, you go home. There's no NIT. That's it. It was great pressure on you, your teammates, the coaches, and you can see it, especially if you're in the finals. And he said, one game, it's a crapshoot. If you're playing against a team, they can get hot, and you bye-bye, baby, you, that's it. But it was Duke that got hot, blowing past Virginia, State, and Wake to give Bubis his second ACC championship. Heyman and Mullins earned all tournament honors, while Heyman became the first Blue Devil to receive the tournament's Most Valuable Player Award. Wake Forest was coming back a little and we had a timeout and usually I never talk or no one ever talks in the huddle so I said coach just tell Jeff to get the ball take it out give me the ball and everybody get out of the way and I'll go into the basket and I got a three-point play and we just blew them out after that having survived their do-or-die weekend in Raleigh the Blue Devils sought to conquer new territory in the NCAA tournament writing Mullins most valuable player performance in the Eastern Regional Duke advanced to its first Final Four in school history Despite a combined 50 points from Heyman and Mullins, Duke was eliminated in the semifinals by eventual national champion Loyola of Chicago. That game marked the end of Art Heyman's great career. He finished as a three-time All-American, leading his team to top 10 finishes each year. And he was the second Duke player to be named National Player of the Year. When he took a shot, he was not the greatest shooter in the world, but he might have been one of the world's best at getting the ball back and sticking it back in. 
that was his greatest threat. And uh, another thing that people don't realize about Art Heyman is I'm not so sure but what he wasn't as good a passer as ever played for me at Duke. People don't understand that. He could get the ball to the open man. And how much better can you do than be the nation declared the nation's number one player, which is what he did. I can't, I really can't add anything to that. In Heyman's absence, the 1964 Blue Devils had to rely more on Mullins, who became the sixth Duke player to earn All-America honors. Mullins heroics led Duke to another first place finish in the league with a 13-1 ACC record. Duke was so impressive, in fact, that after Bubis's Bandits demolished three opponents by a total of 68 points in the ACC tournament, State's Everett Case called the 64 Devils the best team in ACC history. After earning ACC Player of the Year honors and the MVP award in the ACC tournament, Mullins carried Duke to a first round NCAA victory over Villanova with one of the great individual performances in school history. Playing the full 40 minutes, Mullins' hot hand produced 43 points and led Bubis and the Devils to another new plateau, the National Championship game. Unfortunately, Duke ran into UCLA at a time when John Wooden and the Bruins were embarking on their mind-boggling run of nine national titles in 10 seasons. Despite 22 points from their ace shooter, Mullen's stellar career and the Blue Devils' season of seasons ended one step short of their ultimate goal. It was a disappointment, but uh, I guess you kind of look, have to look at it in the proper way and say there'd be a lot of teams glad to be playing for the national championship, which we were, but then you want to you want to win it. The 1965 Blue Devils went 20 and 5, finishing first in the ACC in the regular season and 10th nationally despite a premature season ending ACC tournament loss to NC State. Multi talented forward Jack Marin and long range bomber Bob Verga earned all ACC honors on a high speed, high scoring squad that broke the 100 point mark nine times, including a still record 136 point outburst against Virginia and averaged more than 92 points a game. This up-tempo team showcased Marin, a six-foot-six junior who was ahead of his time in the college game, a big man who could truly do it all. Well, until Grant Hill came along, I thought Jack was the most complete player that we had had at Duke. Uh, there wasn't anything he couldn't do. In 1966, the Blue Devils ended the regular season with a sparkling 20-3 record and another first place finish in the ACC. As they learned the year before, however, their season was just beginning in the do or die ACC tournament. You know, people say there's a lot of pressure in basketball now. I'm gonna reconstruct something for you. I'll tell you what pressure is all about. Pressure is being an undefeated team in the ACC with one team going to the NCAA, no teams allowed to go to the NIT, not playing on your home court and knowing in advance that three teams might hold the ball on you and there is no shot clock. Now, if you want to understand what pressure is, try that one on for size. In the final against NC State, MVP and Player of the Year Steve Vesendak was one of five Duke starters in double figures as the Devils gave Bubas his fourth and final ACC championship. With regional victories over St. Joe's and Syracuse, Bubis and the Blue Devils accomplished a rare feat, three Final Fours in four years. This time as he prepared for the Final Four, Duke's seventh year coach thought he was bringing along a little something extra. You have thoughts that come to your mind, you say them and then you wonder later if that's the way it was. But I thought during the regionals that that team in 66 was the best team I ever had. They were the hardest to beat. We had a little bit of everything. And uh, Bob Virgo was playing absolutely his best basketball. And for whatever reason, I don't know, he got very sick after the regionals and was in the hospital all the way up until we got on the bus to go to the airport to go to Maryland. And I tried to play him against Kentucky. And uh, it didn't work out. And uh, r afterward, and appropriately so, the media said, well, if he had it all to do over again, would you play him? And I said, well, let me ask you this. If you had Mickey Mantle sitting on the bench and you had a chance to put him up at the plate and he wasn't feeling quite well, would you try? And that was the way I felt. The second part of it was, if I had it all do over again, would I do it? No, because we lost that way. <laughs> but you don't get a second chance to go back and replay the game. 
But I thought that was our best team. Um, whether we would have beat Kentucky with a well verger or not, you can argue about that till the cows come home. But um, we didn't do it, and that's all there is to it. Verger returned with a vengeance as a senior in 1967, earning All-America honors for the second time and being selected All-ACC for the third consecutive season. Despite playing in an era that predated the three-point shot, the sharpshooting Verga averaged a school record and ACC best 26 points a game as the Blue Devils rolled to an eighth straight top 20 finish. As the Bubis era came to a close, one more player left his mark on Duke history. Mike Lewis, the ultimate blue-collar center, was overshadowed by Marin and Verga his first two years, but emerged as a senior in 1968 to make All-American. Lewis led the ACC in rebounding his first season in 1966 and went on to become one of the most prolific rebounders in conference history. His 402 boards as a senior still ranks as the second best single season mark in school history. Bubis' 10th and final season saw the arrival of Duke's next great player. Randy Denton, a 6'10 center from Raleigh, led the Blue Devils in scoring and rebounding as a sophomore in 1969. It was a fitting finale for the man who lifted Duke basketball to unprecedented levels of success. In the 60s under Bubis, Duke won 213 games and lost only 67. But even the best of times must end. I decided that that was enough, that I'd had enough, I was satisfied. I think if we wouldn't have won so much, I couldn't have left. Because then you're trying to prove that you could have done it. Now, we didn't win the national championship, but I. I didn't want to stay until I was 65 to try to prove that we could. I never felt it was a mistake, never thought about it, never thought about going back into coaching. Um, they make more out of shoe contracts now than I did, did for three years of coaching. But um, money wasn't a thing. It was time to change. Vic Buba stayed on at Duke as an administrator and had the rare chance to handpick his successor, his former assistant, Bucky Waters. It seems just a very short time since I left, four years, and I'm looking forward to coming back to Duke. Uh, it's a great responsibility, great challenge, tough league, but uh, we've become very fond of the state, of the people, and we're real happy to be coming home. Waters offered a change in style from Bubis's fast-paced squads, concentrating on pressure defense and getting the ball inside to Denton, Duke's 10th All-American in 1971. I say I was fortunate. I never got hurt. I got a chance to play every night, and I did the best I could. And I wasn't expecting to be All-American. Uh, as it turned out, I, I did have a chance to be All-American in my senior year, and it's an honor that I'll never forget and I'll cherish forever. The highlight of the 1972 season came on January 22nd, when Duke dedicated its indoor stadium to Eddie Cameron, who would retire as athletic director later that year. To commemorate this special occasion, the Blue Devils upset number three North Carolina as senior Robbie West put in the game-winning basket with just three seconds to play. The building had only just received his name when the Cameron legacy had begun. But the 72 season also marked the beginning of lean times for Duke basketball. From 72 to 77, a span that included Waters' retirement, one year from interim head coach Neil McGahee, and the arrival of the energetic Bill Foster, the Blue Devils lost six more games than they won and finished last in the ACC for the first time. As a player, it was very, very difficult at that time. I mean, we, we couldn't accept as players the fact that each year we were learning a new system and we had to uh, adapt to a new personality that was leading us. And, and uh, I remember as a 20-year-old, as a we questioned everything. And again, that was the period of questioning, if you remember the Woodstock, longer hair, everything was uh, Vietnam, everything was in a uproar on camp campus, so we questioned everything. and and uh, why our coaches were leaving, we questioned, and why we needed new coaches, we questioned, and it, it was a difficult period. But even the down years had their share of memorable moments. In 1973, Duke upset number three Maryland as all-ACC senior Gary Melchioni played the middle in Waters' famed Mongoose offense, scoring a career-high 39 points. During the 10 and 16 season of 1974, McGahee's Blue Devils beat Virginia at Cameron Indoor Stadium. In so doing, Duke became just the eighth school to reach the magical 1,000 win mark. After his arrival in Durham in 1975, Bill Foster compiled a 500 record in his first three seasons. But Foster had established a reputation as a rebuilder, and something inside told him he could do the same thing at Duke. At somehow or another, I, I really followed Duke. I liked Duke all along. 
Even in high school, I followed Duke. I remember listening to games when I, even when I was at Rutgers coaching that uh, I would listen on the radio, Clear Channel Station out of Charlotte, listen to Duke games. Vic Bubis, I had gotten to know and their coach, and I really had a great deal of respect for him. I just followed it. Coach Foster brought in a, a good staff with him. You know, uh, Lou Getz and Bob Wenzel, two young guys that I think uh, had some interaction with the players that was very positive. And, and a coach, coach, of course, Coach Foster was very well respected in the coaching ranks. When he came in, he was president of the Coaches Association. So, you know, right then, I, I think our players began to feel a little bit more stability. And with stability came recruits, a big one every year for three straight years. It all started in 1976 when Jim Spinarkle, a relatively unheralded swingman from Jersey City, New Jersey, went south for the first time in his life and found a new home. When I visited the campus, I was just blown away. I mean, here a kid from New Jersey and Jersey City um, had never seen a place like Duke University. And when Bob Wenzel picked me up at the airport and I drove around the, the chapel drive there and looked up and I saw the, uh, the chapel, I said, uh, this, is like, this is like Dorothy from the, the Wizard of Oz here. You know, I've reached the place that I want to go to school. In 77, it was Mike Jaminski, a young and talented center from Monroe, Connecticut, who averaged 40 points and 20 rebounds a game as a high school junior. Catching most recruiters off guard by graduating from high school early, the 17-year-old Jaminski became an instant starter in Durham. Mike uh, was another piece of the puzzle. You can't have just one big guy. You've got to have a lot of pieces in the puzzle. To play in the league is fine and as competitive as the ACC. And he just kept getting better and better and gave us the big, uh, as Al McGuire used to say, an aircraft carrier in the middle. Before that, we had a young man by the name of Tate Armstrong that I thought that really helped get us on the way. Extremely dedicated. And as we saw him working out, other players joined in, and he was a key and very instrumental in our getting better. Tate was one of the hardest workers I'd ever seen. He was the first guy I'd ever seen, you know, who really put in the time. And I used to see him run by himself. Um, and I never did that in high school. I'd go out with guys and run. I never ran in high school to get better. I used to see him working out in the gym to work on his moves, to work on his shot. And obviously Tate Armstrong was one of the better shooters to come through Duke University. Uh, to this day still, I'd say that. And so I just started to take his, his work habits and kind of implement them into what I did. And I mean, there were many times that I was I mean, I spent hours in this gymnasium in Cameron Indoor Stadium working on my game, and a lot of it is a byproduct of picking it up from Tate and just watching him by example get better. Foster completed his rebuilding process in 1978 as he grabbed one of the nation's top high school players, Philadelphia's Gene Banks. Gene was one of the two best uh, players in the country that time. at that time. Uh, it was Albert King and Gene Banks. And so you're recruiting the number one guy. In fact, Gene Banks thought there was only one top player in the country, and that was him. Lost in the circus-like atmosphere surrounding the Banks signing was Foster's addition of six foot seven Kenny Denard, who would prove to be yet another important part of Duke's return to national prominence. Kenny was one of the pieces to that team that we had that really didn't get as much uh, glory or headlines as maybe Jaminski or Banks or myself did. Every single team needs one of Kenny Denard. You know, a guy who may not have the greatest scoring average, but a guy who is just going to be there every single night. As the pieces came together, though, it, it just exploded. And as we said, I think we went from, you know, the, the bottom to the top to the penthouse in one year. And we just kept going, kept getting more confidence and kept winning. And, uh, you know, it just the team just really gelled and, and everything went together at one time. It was amazing. Jaminski and Spinarkel were all conference as the Blue Devils completed the regular season with a 20 and six mark. Then Jaminski, Spinarkel and Banks earned all tournament honors, leading the way for Foster's first ACC championship. Spinarkel was the star of the show, averaging 18 points a game and earning the most valuable player award. The road to the final four was not an easy one, but the Blue Devils survived a first round scare from Rhode Island and advanced to St. Louis for their first Final Four in 12 years. The semifinal matchup against sixth-ranked Notre Dame was appropriately billed as the Battle of the Beef. The Blue Devils' strong and sturdy front line of Jaminski, Banks, and Denard, affectionately known as the Duke Power Company, matched up against the likes of 6'9", 235-pound Dave Batten and 6'11", 250-pound Bill Lambeer. The whole week before the Notre Dame game, we were reading about how tough they were and how how big uh, and how strong they were. Bill Ambeer, Bruce Flowers, Kelly Trapuca, you know, and how they were going to play football on the court and 
all this stuff. And we had some pretty good big people, Gene Banks, Mike Jaminski, myself, were no slouches, and we were big and beefy. So we took that challenge, and the whole week we got to build up and kind of uh, eat raw meat the whole week so we could get ready for that game, and we came out and we put it to them. Jaminski led the way inside with 29 points, but it was six-foot point guard John Harrell who hit two free throws with nine seconds remaining to end an Irish comeback and give Duke a 90-86 to win and a spot in the finals against top-ranked Kentucky. The Wildcats needed one of the most unbelievable individual performances in Final Four history to keep the Devils from winning their first national championship. Jaminski had 20 points and 12 rebounds to keep Duke close, but Jack Goose Givens of the Wildcats hit 18 of 27 shots for 41 points as Kentucky held off a late Duke rally to win 94-88. to He's wearing my championship ring right now. I would have liked to, at that particular year for the champion NCAA championship to be a best two out of three because I doubt he would have had 41 the next night. <laughs> Unrealistically high expectations followed the team in 1979. Jaminski and Spinarkel joined Larry Bird and Magic Johnson as first team All-Americans and Duke finished in a tie for first in the regular season. But the Blue Devils lost the ACC final to North Carolina and were eliminated by a two-point loss to St. John's in the first round of the NCAA tournament. Duke's unexpectedly quick exit ended the spectacular career of Spinarkel, who left Durham as the Blue Devils' all-time leader in points, assists, and steals. He was just a very, very complete player, uh, a coach on the floor, but just everything. He never gave you a minute's trouble. He always went to class. He just, he just did everything and uh, did it so well. The 1980 season turned out to be Foster's last at Duke, but it wasn't without memories. Senior Mike Jaminski put together his third consecutive All-American season, the first Duke player since Art Heyman to accomplish that feat. Jaminski left holding school records for points, rebounds, field goals, blocked shots, and games played. But one moment he'll always remember is his last home game, when number 43 became just the second Duke player to have his number retired. It was an emotionally crippling experience almost. I, uh, I, I really don't see how I played the game. Um, as a result of that, I made a recommendation to the athletic department that they announce to players that they're going to retire their jersey beforehand and give them a little chance to prepare for it. And they, they kind of sprung that on me that night. And that combined with the last home game, I, I, for, the first, for the first 10 minutes, I, I really I couldn't play. I was awful. Fortunately, we went into overtime, so I got to play five extra minutes at home. The Blue Devils went on to defeat Clemson that night and completed the regular season with a 19-7 mark and the sixth seed in what would be Foster's last ACC tournament. He guided his team to wins over third seed NC State and second seed North Carolina and faced top seed Maryland in the finals. Duke kept it close down to the wire when Jaminski's tip-in gave the Devils a one-point lead with five seconds left. That set up one of the most talked about plays in tournament history. As Albert King's shot hung on the rim, Kenny Denard and Maryland's Buck Williams battled for position. The two hit the ground with no foul being called, and Duke celebrated another ACC title. But people are still asking whether or not the Blue Devils' crafty forward purposely undercut the Terrapin's star player to save the game. I did not undercut Buck Williams. I hope people will take the time to understand the laws of physics. Two strong men, six feet eight, pushing each other, pushing back and forth a, a chess game, a physical chess game. And then of course, Buck jumped up in the air. Where was I to go? Except to go under him, which made it look like I undercut him. But I didn't. And that's why there was no foul called. Because I think one of those referees was a physics major in college and he understood the principles. Now, that was great news and great pub that, hey, Kenny Denard undercut Buck Williams to win the game. But that's just not the truth. And I'm glad I get to set the record straight. Uh, first of all, it's K-R-Z-Y-Z-E-W-S-K-R. -E and uh, if you think that's bad, it was a lot worse before I changed it. <laughs> Upon Foster's departure, athletic director Tom Butters searched for the best available coach in America. When Duke hired 32-year-old Mike Krzyzewski, who was coming off a 9-17 and 17 year at Army, a lot of eyebrows were raised in college basketball circles, but it turned out to be a perfect match. I kind of talked to myself and said, I'm going to tell them exactly the way I feel. In other words, I'm not going to scout them and try to find out what answers they might like to hear, but I'm going to just say exactly how, 
how I feel about things. And then if they like that, then I know we'll get off to a, a great start. Apparently that approach hit well with uh, uh, the search committee and especially with Tom Butters, our athletic director. He was everything I was looking for in a basketball coach. I was struck by him in every way that I tried to measure him, as I do with all of our employees that uh, I'm responsible for hiring. In, in every measure, um, he was precisely what I was looking for. Krzyzewski's first team finished 17-13 and, and advanced to the 1981 National Invitation Tournament. But that year may be remembered most for the departure of Banks, one of the most colorful athletes ever to wear the royal blue uniform. Nicknamed Tinkerbell because he seemed to float above the basketball court, as in Peter Pan, the strong-armed forward earned All-America honors in both 1979 and 81. Ever the showman, Banks saved his best for last in his final home game against arch-rival North Carolina. His performance was highlighted by an almost impossible play in the final moments of regulation that helped turn a near-certain defeat into a stunning overtime victory. To hit that shot rock bottom like I did, that was the closest feeling of being close to God in, in heaven. And I don't mean that to be uh, blasphemous, because if you see a poster, I had my hands clenched up in the air, and I was like, my eyes were shut, and the fans were carrying me around the room. It was like I was one with the, the, the heavens. That was, to me, my gift to Duke, and it was just a phenomenal situation. I'll never forget that as long as I live. That was a great moment. But what came next was a turning point for Duke basketball. Consecutive losing seasons in 1982 and 83 tested the resolve of everyone associated with the Duke basketball program. Few understood it at the time, but Coach K's top-rated recruiting class of 1983, which included Johnny Dawkins, Mark Allery, David Henderson, and myself, promised great things to come. Tom Butters understood it. In the midst of turmoil and people calling for Coach K's departure, he extended Coach K's contract. It turned out to be a great decision for Duke basketball and one of the best decisions Tom Butters ever made. It's easy to say in retrospect that they were wrong, but I felt genuinely they were wrong at that time. And I was hired to make decisions then, not after the fact. And so consequently I acted upon what I felt was good judgment. And um, fortunately for this program and for me perhaps, that judgment proved to be right. Those struggles, I think, are what made us the team that we became in 1986. Is going through those, going through that adversity, you know, losing some big games, some teams blowing us out, actually. And I remember Virginia in the ACC tournament, they may have beat us by like 40-something points. And I can remember I didn't like that feeling. First time I'd ever been beaten that bad by a team. And uh, I said to myself, it'll never happen again. When the class of 1983 churned out a 24-10 record as sophomores, the rest of the league started to take notice. Krzyzewski's recruiting efforts also continued to pay off. Freshman point guard Tommy Amaker teamed with Dawkins in the backcourt and fit in well with the talented sophomore class. When Tommy Amaker got here the next year, that's when you know, I really felt that we had everything in place and, and we, we could contend for a national championship. So really, I, Tommy was the was the, the final piece of the puzzle. In 1985, Duke improved to 23-8 and eight and advanced to the NCAA tournament for the second straight year. By 1986, Duke added highly touted freshman forward Danny Ferry, who was able to contribute immediately. But that group of 1983 freshmen, now seniors, were the heart and soul of what was truly a team. Dawkins, who became Duke's third national player of the year, carried the scoring load night after night. Amaker was the floor leader and the pace setter, an excellent defender who kept his assists up and his turnovers down. Allery was an all-ACC performer who could go inside or outside on offense and led the Blue Devils in rebounding. Henderson was Mr. Clutch, an unsung performer to whom teammates often looked for the big play in close games. And they even had a pretty good center in Jay Billis, a hard-working rebounder and defender who made sure opposing shooters never got too comfortable. You had a chemistry, you had a bond there that uh... You only develop over time, and uh, we were fortunate that uh, we didn't have any major injuries and things of that sort to seep into that year to disrupt that season. Uh, but we had a tremendous amount of luck in a few games that were close, and it was a storybook kind of year until the final game, and 
Uh, it was a year that I think a lot of people remember around here as far as Duke basketball being one of the, one of the best years. The 86 Devils earned victories over St. John's, Kansas, Carolina, Georgia Tech, Notre Dame, and Oklahoma. All top 20 teams on the way to a 29-2 record going into the league tournament. Then, Dawkins averaged 20 points a game to earn MVP honors and give Krzyzewski his first ACC title and the Blue Devils that unforgettable championship feeling. It's funny that you play uh, 14 games you know, in the ACC and it really doesn't count for anything because you go into the tournament and all that does is help you get a, a better seating, you know, but it, it doesn't mean a whole lot. So it all comes down to the tournament. To consider myself uh, a champion or to consider myself part of a successful team we had to win that tournament. You know, just cutting down the nets is something that that's a great experience for you, I mean, because everyone's so pumped up and you know that when you cut down those nets that you've achieved one of your goals. And winning an ACC championship was definitely one of our goals. It took us four years to get one, but hey, we got it. And it's something that I'll always cherish. And there was more success to come. Behind all region performers Dawkins and Allery, Duke romped to four wins by an average of 16 points a game to advance to Dallas for the school's fifth trip to the Final Four and Coach K's first. In the semis, Duke stuffed number two Kansas and All-American Danny Manning, holding him to just four points as the Devils fought their way to an exhilarating 71-67 victory. Two nights later, Dawkins poured in 24 points, but a late Duke rally fell short at the end and Louisville escaped with a three-point win in the national championship. The hard work and dedication of the 1986 team reflected Krzyzewski's style and opened the way to the future. Since that season, Coach K's honors and accomplishments are mind-boggling. He has taken the Blue Devils to five straight Final Fours and six in the last seven years. More importantly, he remains a lifetime favorite off the court in the hearts and minds of his players. He gave me the kind of freedom and, and the players here the kind of freedom to express themselves on the court. And you don't often get that. He gave me and, and the rest of the players on the team freedom to create situations for ourselves on the court. It wasn't always an X and O, go here, go there thing. He was very fair. When you played poorly, you heard it from him. When you played well, you heard it. Um, he, he just provided a, you know, an excellent atmosphere uh, to achieve in. He's a tough coach in a good way. I mean, he, he pushed me, and it wasn't, he didn't do it in a wrong way or anything like that. He pushed me, and I think in a good way, a lot of different times. I mean, there was, you know, he'd, say, he'd get on me a lot, and I liked that. I mean, it, it helped me a great deal, I think. Um, but at the same time, he was always a good friend. I've respected him and loved playing for him more than, you know, anyone in my whole life, I, I would say. And no, I, don't, I won't enjoy anyone else coaching me ever again in the rest of my life. Mike has done a terrific job of, of bringing in everybody who's played before he came to Duke as coach and made them feel a part of the program. And that doesn't happen a lot. It, it, uh, you know, I've talked to players from different schools who have gone through coaching changes, and you know, not everybody reaches back. But I, you know, Coach K knows how important the tradition is here at Duke, and he really makes us feel a part of, of this program and the whole process and, and you know, what he's accomplished. And uh, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, I'm very grateful for that. After a 1987 trip to the Sweet 16, Coach K was back in the top 10 and back to the Final Four in 88 with a new mix of characters. Only Ferry, a junior, remained from the regular rotation in 86. Quinn Snyder and Kevin Strickland took over in the backcourt, and senior Billy King staked his claim as one of the nation's top defenders. That group earned another conference crown, giving Krzyzewski his second ACC title. After three NCAA tournament victories, the fifth-ranked Blue Devils faced number one Temple in the East Region Final. There, King forced All-American guard Mark Macon into a dismal 6 of 29 shooting nightmare as Duke rolled to a 10-point win. From there, it was on to Kansas City for Duke's sixth trip to the Final Four as the NCAA tournament celebrated its 50th anniversary. But Krzyzewski's second trip to the national semifinals ended with a 66-59 loss to eventual national champion Kansas. The 1989 season marked the further development of a Duke dynasty and the final season for Ferry, who became the fourth player in school history to be named National Player of the Year. His 58-point outburst at Miami that year ranks as the top single-game performance in school history. 
By the time they retired as number 35, Mr. Versatility ranked in the top 10 in school history in points, rebounds, assists, blocks, and steals. Indeed, for four years, Ferry showcased a variety of skills rarely seen in a man his size. I'm not sure if there's been a more, more versatile player at Duke than Danny. Uh, inside, outside, we had him playing point guard sometimes, center. I mean, he really, he, he really played every position. And it was due to Danny's versatility that I think that we were able uh, to make it that far and be Eastern Regional Champions that year. With Ferry gone in 1990, Duke's strategy changed, but the results didn't. Another prize recruit, freshman guard Bobby Hurley of Jersey City, New Jersey, took over at the point. Three seniors, Phil Henderson, Robert Bricky, and Ala Abdul Nabi, provided experience, and along with 6'11 sophomore forward Christian Leitner, Krzyzewski had a balanced lineup that found different ways to win. The Blue Devils advanced to the Meadowlands for the East Region Finals, where they faced almost certain defeat. Trailing by one with 2.6 seconds remaining, Leitner came through with a special play to save the season. There's this play that Duke has had for about four or five years that the guy taking the ball out on the side, on the side has the option to call a different play. And that, that play is where I just throw the ball in bounds and the person throws it right back to me. The only people who had to know how to do it was me and Brian. The last thing I thought was get as close as I could to the bucket. And I took one dribble and made a real lucky shot. Leitner's dramatic shot and Duke's stunning one-point win sent the Blue Devils to Denver for their fourth Final Four in five years. In the national semifinals, Arkansas promised Duke 40 minutes of hell, forgetting that would make the Devils feel right at home. Behind Henderson's 28 points, Duke rolled to a 14-point victory and a berth in Coach K's second national title game. This time, the Devils ran into the red-hot running Rebels, who raced to a 30-point victory. It was a loss Duke would not soon forget. Like so many Duke teams before them, the 1991 Devils had tremendous success. They became the ninth team in school history to finish first in the ACC regular season. They were the ninth Duke squad and fourth in a row to reach the Final Four. Duke's semifinal opponent was an all too familiar one, UNLV, which returned much of the same cast of All-Stars that trounced the Devils one year before. But this time, things turned out a lot different. I think it was Coach K's job all week to try and make us believe we can win. Um, coming off um, the previous season, losing you know, my 30 points and that, I, I don't know going in if the guys felt like you know, we can win but once we got into the game and, and we took a 10-point lead early and saw that we could play with those guys, and as the game went along, we started getting more and more confidence. And uh, once we were in a position to win, we felt like it was our time to, to really capitalize on that and, and win that game. It was Hurley who delivered when Duke needed it most. With just over two minutes to play, Hurley drained a three-pointer to cut into UNLV's five-point lead. Then, after Duke's patented defense forced a 45-second shot clock violation, Brian Davis converted a three-point play to give Duke a one-point lead. With 12 seconds left and a tie score, Leitner calmly sank two free throws, and the defense put the final touches on a 79-77 triumph. The Blue Devils had shocked the college basketball world, but the job was not complete. There were 40 minutes yet to play. Two nights later, Duke got off to a flying start in the championship game against Kansas and never looked back. Hurley and Grand Hill teamed up for the now famous alley-oop dunk in the opening minutes and Leitner finished the job, scoring 18 points to grab MVP honors as Duke rolled to a 72-65 victory. Finally, with that one last broad stroke, the long successful Duke basketball program had its masterpiece. The 91 ch national championship I think made all the Final Fours before that better. Uh, it, it gave Duke uh, the basketball program, not that team, its rightful place in the history of our great sport. Because uh, truly Duke is one of the, the great programs in the history of college basketball. Christian Leitner followed as the most recent in a long line of Blue Devil All-Americans. In 1992, he completed his storybook career by becoming Duke's fifth National Player of the Year. Fittingly, Leitner joined Grote, Heyman, Jaminski, Dawkins, and Ferry as the only Blue Devils to have their numbers retired. I mean, you start making the list, and 
you can check it twice, three times, or four times, and you're going to find you're not you're not not going to find one another player. I don't think that has done more in the NCAA tournament. And of course, the fact that we we won two national championships kind of puts that stamp of of, uh, of approval on on him. But uh, truly, one of the the greats and uh, uh, and Mr. Clutch. Along with Duke's 19th and 20th All-Americans, Bobby Hurley and Grant Hill, Leitner led the 1992 Devils to one of the great seasons in college basketball history, starting the season ranked number one and staying there to the end. And after finishing first in the regular season, Duke swept away Clemson, Georgia Tech, and North Carolina to claim a ninth conference crown. At NCAA tournament time, it looked as if nothing could stop the Blue Devils, but something almost did. After winning their first three games by an average of 17 points, Duke faced high-scoring Kentucky in the East Region Final. In what was called one of the greatest games ever in college basketball, the Devils and Wildcats traded exceptional plays down the stretch and into overtime. When Kentucky's Sean Woods banked in a wild shot with just 2.1 seconds remaining for a one-point lead, the Blue Devils called timeout to set up one last chance to do the impossible. Needless to say, they look to a man who hadn't missed a single shot all night. Bobby Hurley up the floor with Leitner. They throw it the left of the floor. Leitner catches, comes down, dribbles, shoots, scores! Christian Leitner has hit the bucket at the buzzer. The Blue Devils win it, 104 to 103. Look out, Minneapolis. Here come the Blue Devils. Leitner's impossible shot ended one of the finest performances in tournament history as the Blue Devil senior hit all 10 of his field goal tries and all 10 free throws to finish with 31 points. After the wild celebration in Philadelphia, it was back to earth in a hurry as Duke stormed past Indiana to advance to a third straight national final. The Metrodome was rocking as the defending champions prepared to meet Michigan. After an even first half, the veteran Blue Devils pulled away behind Leitner who polished off his illustrious career with 19 points. Grant Hill, the link to the unlimited possibilities of the future, added 18 points, while Hurley was named most valuable player. The first title was probably more exciting because it was new to me, and um, we beat UNLV, which was probably the greatest team I've ever played against. But the second title was special because it was something that you know, no one has done in a long time. Mike Krzyzewski and the Blue Devils of the 90s have lifted the program to unprecedented success. Back-to-back -back national championships offer a fitting tribute to the rich tradition that began almost 90 years ago. I think we all aspired to, um, to make it as good as we could make it. I think we've done that. And that doesn't mean that you win national championships. What it does mean is that you become the best that you can be. And if at the end of the day, that um, allows you to be a champion, then so be it. When people ask me, well, what mountains do you still want to climb, and uh, you know, what what places do you still want to see? I say, hey, I want to stay on top of the mountain we got, and uh, we can still see a lot of great things uh, because you see them through the eyes of the new kids that you have coming into your program, and uh, uh, both on and off the court, and. Uh, Duke makes me better, and hopefully we have helped make Duke a little bit better too.